what I'm standing right here now. It doesn't take me a second to think of a dozen of my loved ones scattered all over the earth and put them all here. Oh, I could be there. It makes no difference. All things are possible to the imagination. Because all things exist in my imagination. Where must I go outside of myself to find anything if it all exists in my imagination? So I don't have to go traveling for it. It exists here. What is my need now in Caesar's world? What does exist in my imagination? Lay hold of it. Touch it. Become attached to it. Fasten yourself to it. Actually feel the reality of it. You can feel it. May I tell you, the minute you begin to feel it, it is done. Get the satisfaction, as I've always said, of all the pleasures of the world. Relief is the most keenly felt. At the end of the creative act, it is relief. Until you reach the climax, you can't. It is, there must be the climax for relief. And then it's done. And he knew the power had gone out, for he felt it. And when they all denied it, well, can you see a scene where multitudes are pressing? How many must have touched him? But they have only one touched him. All the others touched the outer garment, but they didn't touch him. For he is all spirit. He is all imagination. And people are looking for him to come into flesh. When you meet the risen Lord, it's folly before you. As far as you're concerned, it is flesh, but it isn't. Because how could flesh embrace another being of flesh? and the two become one. There is no such thing as such a union in this world of season. So I was in spirit, and he is spirit. For well, God is spirit. And as he embraced me, the two became one. And he imprinted himself upon me. But I had then to bear his likeness by having that pattern unfold within me. So we are called, all gathered, one by one. So when we understand the story, the infinite drama, as it is presented in Scripture, I often wonder how these translators did such a wonderful job so as not to offend people, intelligent as they told it. Just imagine wrestling through the night. And then, because he didn't prevail, he touched his thigh. And then the thigh shrank. And then Jacob, who is now called Israel, limped. And he made a mental picture of a man whose thigh shrank. And it isn't that at all. Take the word in your concordance and look up the word thigh, and you receive a shock when you see what it is. But it's much better to say thigh for those who could be offended if you actually knew what is taking place. The creative act is over and the organ shrinks. And that's the story of God and man. So here, this inner you is real. It's the immortal you. It cannot die. I don't care what happens to you from now on. You cannot die. You are this immortal, incorruptible being. And while you're here, for a purpose, in time you'll be called. You'll be called into that union with the risen Lord. And then you can come today from that union on. And it will be 30 years, so you're told in the gospel. And he began his work when he was about 30 years of age. Has nothing to do with 30 years from the time you were born as a little child. It's from the time that you actually were incorporated through that union into the body of God. And you can come to it from then on. It was 1929, all right, so I was 24. Come to 30, and you find me 54. It was when I was 54 years of age in the city of San Francisco that the whole thing began to erupt and unfold within me. So he was about 30 years of age 
Now John mentions it. You know Abraham? Why? You're not yet 50. Others put it, why? You are just about 50 years of age. So he brings the age forward into the 50s. It doesn't matter. It could happen, say, at 40. But then you would have to go back to your time when you were 10. Because it's 30 years from the time of that regenerated act. 